you have a cell phone, turn it off, turn on vibrates, please no unnecessary movement and noises. Please remain standing for a word of prayer and a pledge to the flag. We would like to ask Dr. John Purdue of First United Methodist Church to come forward and lead us in our invocation. We're thankful, God, that all government We're thankful, O oh Lord, that all government is of you, that scriptures show us that you have instituted all of government. We pray that our work today would be in sympathy with what you have for all of your people, that you would guide us in wisdom, that you would guide us in strength, that you would help us to make wise decisions for this community. Most especially, oh Lord, we pray that your care would be through our hands on those of the least of us for your scriptures teach that as we care for the least of us we care also for you in christ's name amen, amen. if you would remain standing i will come down and we have a special pledge of allegiance tonight It's not special because of me. It's special because of who's giving or leading us in the pledge. Uh, Tyrone Sparkman, and this is something that describes what Tyrone has done for us in our country. On May 27th, 1966, during the Vietnam conflict, Tyrone received a letter. The letter stated, greetings, you have been inducted into the armed forces of the United States. Two weeks later, on June 6th, 1966, he left on a Greyhound bus along with 42 other men who were being drafted into the United States Army. First to Nashville for swearing in, a few hours later on another Greyhound bus headed to Fort Benning, Georgia. Upon completion of 12 weeks of basic training, he received orders for AIT or Advanced Infantry Training in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. He trained for 10 weeks in heavy artillery at Fort Sill. Upon completion of Advanced Infantry Training, he received orders for Korea. He did not get any leave time, only a five-day transit delay. On October 26, 1966, he left for Korea to serve his country. His MOS was changed and he was going into combat. He served for 14 months in Korea in combat and his assignment placed him on the demilitar demilitarized zone north of the Imjin River. Today, the demilitarized zone in Korea is still the most dangerous border in the world. Tyrone served in the 3rd Battalion, 23rd Infantry, 2nd Infantry Division, in May 1967, he became Sergeant E-4, and in September 1967, he became Sergeant E-5. He served many months in foxholes and witnessed lives lost. In December 1967, Tyrone received orders to return to the U United States and was sent to Fort Ord, California. At Fort Ord, he was a supply clerk issuing supplies to basic trainees. Tyrone served actively until June 8, 1968. He remained in the reserves until May 1971. And his awards includes National Defense Service Medal, Good Conduct Medal, Expert Infantryman Badge, Sharpshooter M14, MGen Scout Insignia from Korea for commendable service in operational mission along the demilitarized zone in Korea. And he wrote, serving my country in combat as an inf infantryman gave me an opportunity to experience conditions I would not have had otherwise. My country allowed me to walk through the valley of death with some of the best men this world has ever witnessed. I am blessed that I met them. I was blessed to serve my country. And I want to say we know uh, Tyrone is probably one of the meekest person, persons on our committee. He's very meek. And I'm, I'm very proud of your service. And we want you to lead us. If you can, we want you to lead us in the pledge. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
And with that, I call this meeting to order. Call the roll, please. Michael Bell. Here. Carl D. Bolden. Carl E. Bolden. Here. Carlene Brown. Here. David Dunlap. Here. Randy England. Here. Deborah Evans. Here. Steve Glenn. Here. Richard Grissom. Here. Stephen Helton. Here. Robert Hennessy. Here. Lori Jenkins. Here. Ron Lee. Here. Gary Martin. Here. Daniel Owens. Here. Gary Prater. Here. Christy Ross. Here. Scott Rubley. Here. Tommy Savage. Here. Tyrone Sparkman. Here. Joseph Stotts. Here. Philip Stout. Here. Cole Taylor. Here. Lane Wilcher. Here. We have 23 present. 23 present. At this time, I would entertain a motion to adopt our docket. I'd like to make a motion to amend the docket, please. Move to adopt. We have a motion to adopt the docket. We have a second. Does anybody want to speak to that motion? I'd like to make a motion to amend the docket, please. We have a motion to amend the docket. The motion is to amend the docket to add a new resolution. It would be item 5B, resolution number 7. And it's a resolution affirming Warren County, Tennessee's support of the United States Constitution and the Second Amendment Amendment's right to keep and bear arms. Okay, we have a motion from Commissioner Brown to amend the docket to add this resolution. Do we have a second? We have a second by Commissioner Dunlap. All in favor say aye. aye. No. Aye. All right, we'll have to do a roll call vote. Michael Bale? No. Carl E. Bolden? No. Carlene Brown? Yes. David Dunlap? Yes. Randy England? No. Deborah Evans? Yes. Steve Glenn? No. Richard Grissom? Yes. Stephen Helton? Yes. Robert Hennessy? Yes. Lori Judkins? Yes. Ron Lee? No. Gary Martin? No. Daniel Owens? No. Gary Prater? No. Christy Ross? No. Scott Rubley? No. Tommy Savage? No. Tyrone Spartman? No. Joseph Stotts? No. Philip Stout? No. Cole Taylor? No. Blaine Wilcher? No. Anybody want to change your vote? Okay, motion fails. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Seven yes, 16 no. Motion fails, 16 no, seven yes. So we're back on the original motion and second to accept the docket or approve the docket as is. We've already got a second, so I'm going to go ahead and do a voice vote first. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Next, if you notice, uh, you have uh, some corrected minutes on your on your table. It was a, an adjustment at the bottom as far as the adjournment. And at this time, I would uh, entertain a motion to accept that. And we have a okay. We have a motion from Commissioner Bell. We have a second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Now we didn't have a motion to suspend the reading of the minutes. I so move. You have a motion from Commissioner Savage, a second from Commissioner Stotts. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> Thank you. Next, we have public comment at this time, and I believe first up is Mr. Jeremy McCormick. First of all, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Jeremy McCormick, and I live in District 9. My two commissioners are Mr. Helton and Ms. Brown. Thank you for giving me a moment of your time tonight. I would like to speak with you about the Second Amendment Sanctuary Movement here in Warren County. I'm the one who started the Warren County Stands United page on Facebook. As of right now, we have over 3,000 following members. Tonight, I would like to explain to you the importance of this resolution that's been presented to you. As this resolution is do doing is informing the great state of Tennessee that we, the people of Warren County, have and will always stand united against any infringement upon the Second Amendment. This resolution isn't adding anything to or taking anything away from the Second Amendment. We are simply showing our support for the Second Amendment, just as every commissioner sitting before me took an oath before God to uphold the Constitution. 
We the people of Warren County, by passing this resolution, are simply stating to the great state of Tennessee that we will not stand by and allow Tennessee to forget what it means to be free, as the officials of Virginia have. Myself and two other men in this room went to Richmond, Virginia to stand against this exact tyranny that I'm speaking of tonight. Do not be blind and think that what's happening in Virginia can't happen here. It can and it will if we all don't stand united against this attack. As I close, I would like to recite a quote from Benjamin Franklin. They that can give up essential liberties to attain a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. That being said, everyone sitting before me tonight, remember the oath you took before God to uphold this great constitution of ours. And for as a man once said, the compromises of today will be the standards for tomorrow. Thank you for listening tonight. And if there ever was a time to stand up as an American, the time is now. Next, Ashley Bowden could not be with us tonight, uh, and I will cover her items in our announcements at the end. So that brings us to Kristen Ware. Thank you, everybody. Um, my name is Kristen Ware, and I'm with Air Medicare Network. Um, this is my home, um, and I'm here to talk a little bit about. I was telling you. Uh, Mayor Haley here that I feel like I need to be doing public safety announcements. So for those of you that aren't familiar with Air Medicare Network, we are the largest air medical provider in the country. And the services that are, are available for you in Warren County are our language life force and air evac life team. And the reason I come before you today is because I need your help. Um, as a citizen and a taxpayer and always a potential patient, I don't think the general public realizes the current environment that they find themselves in. You are more likely than ever before to be flown. Your flight volume out of this county is about four times a day. But you also, too, are more likely than ever before to owe these $50,000 bills. Okay? So um, I want to go back a little bit and really talk about why you have these high number of flights that insurance companies aren't paying. You are sitting at a current denial rate by insurance companies of a whopping 50%. Half the time when someone is flown, they owe the bill. Okay? So what's happening is um, it, it has to do with rural hospital closure. Um, that's been going on really for about the last 10 years. You've had 100 of them closed across the country. 12 of those are in Tennessee. I cover 10 counties. Warren, Cannon, Coffee, Grundy, Moore, Rutherford, those were my six when they hired me, and now Bedford, Lincoln, Marshall, and they just gave me Giles County. Um, there's a gentleman that covers nine counties over in, ten, over in uh, West Tennessee, and out, out of the 12, I'm sorry, out of the 100 hospitals that have closed across the country, 12 of those are in Tennessee. Five of those facilities were in half of his territory. So people assume that their local hospital is just going to be available to them, but that's not necessarily the case. And that is where these services are so, so important, okay? So what membership means when you buy a membership, it means that you don't know a penny, not a penny. We cover whatever your insurance doesn't, and we cover you when, when the insurance company doesn't pay it at all. Um, but when you combine the, 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 the high denial rate with membership covering half the cost of a base, community support for these services is more important than ever before. What people may not know, you probably generally do, but we have a specific 911 protocol coming out of this county. Sparta, Winchester, Manchester. Those are helicopter-based locations. It's the way they call every single time, okay? 99.5% of the flights coming out of this county are covered under our membership. And the general public doesn't know it. Um, I, I'm kind of blown away. Out of the 10 counties that I cover, I have the highest coverage rate here. You're pretty much guaranteed. I even called Preston Denny to discuss this with him. I said, when was the last time Vanderbilt flew in here? More than two years ago for a scene flight. They just don't fly in here. But I also have my lowest penetration rate. That means the number of people in the county versus the number of people that are actually members. So, you know, this is information that the general public doesn't know. You know, you even have an issue with, um, and not here, it's not necessarily here, but um, issues with, that, uh, with paramedics and EMTs. There's a shortage, just like there's a shortage of nurses, and you got to remember that they are the people who get, they get you from there to the nurses. Um, and so in some counties, you know, I, I have a couple of counties, actually, that no longer transport people by ground outside county lines. They can't afford it. If you're in Grundy County, they have three trucks for that entire county. If you're up there, 
you're paying t you're paying two runs. You're paying one to the, one to the uh, Grundy EMS, and then you're paying another to a private service, or they're being flown. So um, I need your help, your leaders in this community, to get this information out to your constituents. Um, I'm one person. Miss Ware, I cover an entire area. So I'm sorry, we've no, got a two, we've got a two minute limit. But oh, if you I'm would, sorry, that, that's that. fine. If you would hang around, I'm sure there'll be questions. Well, and afterward. I want to thank Mr. Haley and the county really for just continuing to offer um, this as a benefit to the employees. So, okay, thank, thank you. you. Next. We have special recognition. Uh, Executive Haley, please. It's always a pleasure when we are able to recognize community initiatives that promote education and workforce development. And one of the successful programs, and I think uh, Commissioner England will, will uh, agree with this, is our Skills USA program at our TCAT. And so that exceptional program has identified leaders in our <clears throat> student body at TCAT that excel when they compete across this state and across the nation in some cases as well. And so I was asked to do a proclamation which I will read and if, uh, if Don Linton and her students will come forward as I read this. It says, whereas February 2nd through 8th, 2020 has been designated by the National Skills USA Association as Skills USA Week, and whereas profound economic and technological changes in our society are rapidly reflected in the structure and nature of work, thereby placing new and additional responsibilities on our educational system, and whereas career and technical education provide students with a school to careers connection that is the backbone of a strong, well-educated workforce which fosters productivity in business and industry and contributes to our leadership in the national and international marketplace. Whereas career and technical education gives post-secondary students experience in practical meaning applications of basic skills such as reading, writing, mathematics, and thus improving the quality of their education and motivating at-risk students and giving all students leadership opportunities in their fields and in their communities. Whereas career and technical education offers individual lifelong opportunities to learn new skills which provide them with career choices and potential satisfaction. And whereas the ever increasing cooperative efforts of career and technical educators, business and industry stimulates the growth and vitality of our economy and that of the entire nation by preparing graduates for career fields forecast to experience the largest and fastest growth within the next decade. Whereas Skills USA, a national organization for students preparing for technical, skilled, and service occupations in colleges and technical schools across this nation, helps its members become more world class workers and responsible Americans. And whereas Skills USA is preparing more than 365,000 students to be higher performance workers across the nation, and whereas Tennessee College of Applied Technology, McMillville, has a very active Skills USA chapter. Therefore, I, Jimmy Haley, Warren County Executive, hereby proclaim this last week as Skills USA Week in Warren County as we acquaint ourselves with these students and the programs and the impact that they make upon this workforce. So, congratulations. And you might want to say a little something about yourselves. And Ms. Wendy you might want to say a little something more about their competitions coming up. <laughs> Introduce yourself. Hello, everybody. How's everyone doing tonight? Good. Good? Oh, my name is Ricardo Gomez, and um, well, I'm the president of the Skills USA. And I just want to say I'm very thoughtful to be out here uh, due to the flooding and all this stuff that's been going on. And I just want to say that I'm very blessed to be out here tonight and hear about what you guys have to say tonight. I'm Spencer Johnson. I'm the Vice President of our Skills USA chapter, and uh, thank you very much for acknowledging what we do. It's very important. It's been good to say this up at their competition. Um, we uh, really appreciate the uh, acknowledgement. We are getting ready to compete in the state competition. We actually had two students compete um, last week from our new cosmetology program. And we have two students who will be competing at the state level for machine tool technology, CNC technology. Uh, we have students competing in CIT, one of them right here. Um, we have a student competing in electricity. 
and um, they they put a lot of work into this. They do, their instructors do, but it gives them um, some real world experience and chances to meet employers. So we appreciate the notice. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. proclamation to, uh, to add as well. It's not on the agenda. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but uh, February is Black History Month, and so I proclaimed, and the city mayor also, uh, February is Black History Month as we recognize the contribution of uh, local African Americans, state African Americans, uh, into the uh, cultural uh, diversity that makes our nation, and recognizing those accomplishments over the years. And so there is a notice, I think, on your desk also about a meeting that at the end of this month and so uh, there is a group of us trying to get an african-american uh, community museum started here in mcminnville and so anybody that's interested in attending that there's a notice on your on your desk next thing is to recognize employees and so you know it doesn't really matter you know sometimes what we do necessarily the day-to-day -day operations is really what keeps the county services going and so each elected official uh, has an amazing staff of workers who are here day and night, some way past night, uh, making sure that their job is done before the next day occurs. And so some work on weekends, some do extra duties assigned to them, particularly when it's crunch time. And so uh, our clerk and master, uh, Myra Mara, is here today. And one of her employees I would like to recognize, and a former student I would like to recognize Cora Keaton is our employee of the month. So Cora will come forward. Are you going to come? So Cora, is, I'm doing a little quote from, from Ira here. And uh, she said, over the past several years, we've taken great strides to better organize our permanent records. We've worked with Public Records Commission and also with the Archives Department. Through the help of a grant and the assistance of my employees, we now have all our closed probate files scanned and stored off-site at the administrative building. We also have 20 plus banker boxes of oversized exhibits and depositions ready for disposal. This has freed up an enormous amount of much needed space in our county's vaults. I could not have tackled this enormous task without the help of my employees, Jason Scott, Jane Bennett, and Cora Keaton. And so Cora has been particularly helpful in locating attorneys to send documents to, mailing out letters regarding exhibit disposal, shuffling files and renumbering and relocating those file boxes. Since February, February 5th, this is our sixth anniversary with my office. I would like to submit her name and her to be recognized for the county commission. She's our front desk deputy clerk. She meets and greets the public, answers the phone calls, and takes much time out of the day in order to make all of our clients and customers happy with our services. She also assists petitioners in filling out petitions of order of protection and attends court orders for OPs. She's always willing to go above and beyond and is a tremendous asset not only to my office but also Warren County governance. So, Cora, we'd like to recognize you tonight. Thank you for your service. It's always a pleasure when I go into the office up there. You're always smiling. You're always helpful. And I know you are very much a benefit to all this support from Thank you very much. Thank you, Executive Haley. If you would, you can give your executive report at this time. Well, in front of you is uh, is my executive report. And so in front of you, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because it's four pages long. Uh, January and through February has been uh, a very busy month for me. Uh, I will bring a notice. My criminal justice task force that meets on a quarterly basis. We met over the last couple of weeks, and we've been trying to bring new programs and assist the sheriff the support of his daily operations. At our last meeting, it was announced that uh, we received a grant from the Upper Cumberland Workforce Development, and uh, it was going to be actually paying for the tuition for our virtual welding programs, reentry programs at the jail. We'll also be cooperating with the drug recovery program, and uh, a portion of this grant will also be channeled to Van County for similar programs. So we're very, we were very excited when Becky All and her staff came to, uh, to our meeting. Another thing that she announced also was that uh, we were picked 
and chosen out of 14 counties in the Upper Cumberland for a grant opportunity to create a community resource center here in Warren County. It will be the only one of its kind anywhere in the Upper Cumberland. And so because of the, the accomplishments that we have and the success we've had in criminal justice reform over the last year and a half, they picked us. They've been cooperating with us and in providing instructors for our GED program already. And so this uh, community resource center will be like an air traffic control center for those people transitioning out of the criminal justice system, the homeless, the needy. Uh, this will be able to direct them to where resources are. And so that's one thing that we're very, very excited about. Uh, we negotiated with the Hope Center. We were looking for a, a permanent office and the Hope Center actually offered them office space. And so they're gonna be partnering with us in this initiative. So uh, we're also waiting for another grant to come through through Volunteer Chair Mental Health that will establish a uh, transition house facility to aid those people that have been on opioids or victims of substance abuse. And so we're awaiting the announcement of that grant as well. So we're also trying to partner, which I've already reached out and met with uh, former Supreme Court, Tennessee Supreme Court Justice Penny White to do an expungement clinic in Warren County, which is much needed. So uh, District Attorney's obviously honest, we're still working on that opioid uh, lawsuit. So hopefully there'll be some resources directed here that will help facilitate some of our operations in criminal justice reform as well. So my full report is there with uh, updates on a variety of things. Also acknowledging the retirement of our director of schools, Bobby Cox, who's been a tremendous asset to Warren County and education as he's promoted not only our teachers, but initiatives not only to train our students, but prepare them for the workforce that is ahead of them. So uh, he's a consummate professional. I think he announced in our last education committee over $5 million worth of grants, not in counting the $1 million give grant that came from the governor. So we're all proud of those accomplishments. We want to recognize, and I think it would be good to give you a little standing. So as a reminder, and I'll also make it uh, in the announcements at the end, I'll be uh, sponsoring another gun carry permit class this weekend. We still have a couple of openings, so if anyone's interested in that, uh, if you'll see me or call my office, we'll be able to fix you up. So, thank you. Motion to approve this report. We have a motion from Commissioner Helton to accept the report. We have a second by Commissioner Ross. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Next up, Finance Department. Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the court, you have my report. If you have any questions, I'll do my best to answer them at this time. Move to adopt. We have a motion to adopt by Commissioner Rubley, a second by Commissioner Helton. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Next up is our Highway Department Director, Levy Glenn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of the court, you have my report. If there's any questions, I'll try to answer. Move to adopt. Well, we have a motion by Commissioner Prater. We have a second by Commissioner England. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thank lady. you very much. Next up is our superintendent of schools, Bobby Cox. We have a motion by Commissioner Stotts, a second by Commissioner Stout. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, Bobby. Right. I would like to say, Mr. Chairman, thank you and thank you to the Commission for the support that you've given me over the years. Uh, hopefully in May when we come back we'll have my replacement and I would like to introduce them whenever that decision is made, but I really do appreciate the Commission's support of Warren County Schools over the past eight years and, and the continued support that I know that you'll have in the future, so thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is our Sheriff, Tommy Myers. Thank you, Mr. 
Mr. Chairman and members of the court, you should have a copy of my report. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer. Move to adopt. We have a motion to adopt by Commissioner Lee, a second by Commissioner Bolden. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thank Sheriff. you. And we have uh, our sanitation department director, Josh Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of the court. You have my report. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them at this time. Move to adopt. We have a motion to adopt by Commissioner Bell, a second by Commissioner Glenn. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank, Thank you. you. Next, we'll go into committee reports, and I've got my paper in front of me this time, so we're going to start with budget and finance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Budget finance has nothing to report at this time. Next up is building and grounds. Commissioner Bolden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, building and grounds has nothing to report. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Prater, Economic and Agricultural Development. Our Commissioner Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Economic and Agriculture Committee does not have anything to report at this time. Thank you. Education, Commissioner Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, at our last meeting, the Tennessee Education Association did make a presentation, and they have some comments to share with all of us tonight at the close of our meeting. And also, and Mr. Cox had a report which detailed our meeting, but um, on Monday, March the 2nd at 5 o'clock, our next meeting is actually going to be at the Bobby Ray School where we can take a tour of the project at, at its completion and have an open house if anyone would like to attend. That's Monday, March the 2nd at 5 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Next is financial management. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do you want to cover the budget calendar now or do you want to do it after? Mm, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we're about to begin. The, we're beginning the budget process now. Um, included in your packet was a copy of the budget calendar as adopted by financial management um, on the 31st of January. Um, we are required to present that to the committee. Uh, other than that, uh, financial management has nothing to report at this time. Thank you. Next up is health and welfare, and we have nothing to report at this time either. We'll go on to Highway and Bridge, Commissioner Prater. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, phase two has been completed at the uh, in Irving College up there, and the weather. We've had some heavy rains up there. Everything seems to be holding up good. So maybe if it quit this rain, and we can get it finished. Thank you. Thank you. Legislative Committee, Commissioner Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, on Monday, February the 24th, which is next Monday at 6 o'clock, it's our desire and our hope that we're going to be going through our final draft. Um, if any, and you're all welcome to attend. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Commissioner Savage. If you feel like standing, policy and personnel, I know you're having some Thank you, Mr. Issues. Chairman. On February 11th, the Policy and Personnel Committee met to discuss and vote on the Second Amendment resolution. We had a healthy discussion among the commissioners and visiting commissioners and the audience that was there. And this committee voted 4 to 0 to send this to the full commission. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Next up is safety, Commissioner Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, safety has nothing to report. Thank you. County Corrections Partnership, Commissioner Helton. We had a meeting on February the 4th. We actually got to go over to uh, where uh, the adult recovery program is, and uh, we toured their, their offices and, and seen some of the new office space that they've got, and they were actually having classes during that. And uh, it was very informative and, and eye-opening of, of what they're doing, and we actually got to meet some of the participants of that. Um, 
We uh, uh, population today is uh, 244. Uh, we do have some good news. Uh, HVAC systems are set in to go in on Thursday, and uh, locks and cameras should be begin in March. The installation of those. Um, and uh, what we're really excited about is we finally got all 16 of our COs uh, that uh, hired, and so that uh, that program where we're trying to do the. Uh, um, observation and I, I just left the name there but um, uh, that's that's going to be uh, starting up and, and we're proud of that and we're proud of our, our sheriff's department for everything that they've done and getting this uh, under control thank you next redistricting committee Commissioner England thank you mr. chairman our keep our committee itself doesn't have another report on but I want to remind everybody that this is census year and matter of fact you need a job they're hunting people but it's very very important that when you're contacted that you do help them and get it all filled out correctly because that you know that helps us in the long run thank you thank you and we don't have any unfinished business from last month so we'll go directly into our new business and first up is item number one resolution number two 2020 apply for community development block grant Tommy Lee, so he'll be able to answer any questions. Okay, we have Tommy Lee with us. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Sir? Yes. Oh, yes, sir. I was just sort of curious um, with this, what, what does it entail, and uh, can you explain sort of what, what's going on with it? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, thank you. Uh, so this is a resolution of intent to apply for a community development block grant uh, for Warren County. Uh, we are we're applying on behalf of Warren County Utility District. Uh, utility districts are not eligible to apply, so therefore the county is going to apply on their behalf. Um, the project is to rehab water lines within the, dis within the territory of the Warren County Utility District and also to add some much needed fire hydrants uh, in that area. Uh, total project cost is $483,000. Grant cost would be 420, which the the match, which would be provided entirely by Warren County Utility District of $63,000. And this will include a lot of the rural fire departments as well. Yes, sir. Six, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you. Motion We have a motion from Commissioner Bell. We have a second from Commissioner Glenn. Would anybody like to speak to the motion? Call the roll, please. Yes. Carl E. Bolden. Yes. Carlene Brown. Yes. David Dunlap. Yes. Randy England. Yes. Deborah Evans. Yes. Steve Glenn. Yes. Richard Grissom. Yes. Stephen Hilton. Yes. Robert Hennessy. Yes. Lori Jenkins. Yes. Ron Lee. Yes. Gary Martin. Yes. Daniel Owens. Yes. Gary Prater. Yes. Christy Ross. Yes. Scott Rubley. Yes. Tommy Savage. Yes. Tyrone Spartman. Yes. Joseph Stotts. Yes. Philip Stout. Yes. Cole Taylor. Yes. Lane Wilcher. Yes. Anyone want to change your vote? Twenty-three yes. Motion passes twenty-three yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and ladies and gentlemen of the court. Thank you, Mr. Lane. Next up, item number two, resolution number three, dash twenty twenty, the five year reappraisal plan. Uh, Ms. Martin. Does anyone have any questions? Good evening, Commissioners and Mr. Chairman. I'm just going to let you know that uh, this resolution authorizes that reappraisal shall be accomplished in Warren County by a continuous five-year cycle that will begin July 1st of 2020. Uh, it's compromised of an on-site review of each parcel of real property over a four-year period, followed by reevaluation of all such property for tax year 2025. There are three options that the county has to choose from, that being a four-, five-, or six-year reappraisal plan. Um, the county has chosen the five-year reappraisal plan for the past three cycles and the state's division of property assessments along with my myself and the office uh, feel that the five-year reappraisal plan is the best fit for Warren County. Um, attached to the resolution, I think you all got a copy of a broad overview of the work cycle that's performed by the assessor's office. Um, this is to ensure that all taxable properties within the county are updated fairly and equitably. Anyone has any questions? I'll be happy to try to answer them. Move to adopt. 
We have a motion by Commissioner Rubley, a second by Commissioner Bell. Anybody want to speak to the motion? Call the roll. Michael Bell? Yes. Carl E. Bolden? Yes. Carlene Brown? Yes. David Dunlap? Yes. Randy England? Yes. Deborah Evans? Yes. Steve Glenn? Yes. Richard Grissom? Yes. Stephen Helton? Yes. Robert Hennessy? Yes. Lori Judkins? Yes. Ron Lee? Yes. Gary Martin? Yes. Daniel Owens? Yes. Gary Prater? Yes. Christy Ross? Yes. Scott Rubley? Yes. Tommy Savage? Yes. Tyrone Sparkman? Yes. Joseph Stotts? Yes. Philip Stout? Yes. Cole Taylor? Yes. Blaine Wilcher? Yes. Anyone want to change your vote? 23 yes. Motion passes 23 yes. Thank you, Ms. Martin. Thank you. Next item up is item number three, resolution number four 2020. It's application for Tennessee Housing Development Agency Grant. Mr. Tommy Lee again. Yes, sir. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman and ladies and gentlemen of the court. Uh, this is a resolution of intent to apply for a home rehabilitation grant for Warren County. Um, this grant allows for the rehab of residential homes for low to moderate income persons. Uh, there is zero match uh, involved for the county or the citizens that are uh, being, for the homes that are being rehabbed. And so we just need a resolution of intent to apply for the grant. We have a motion by Commissioner Lee, a second by Commissioner Bolden. Anyone would like to speak to the motion? Mr. Chairman, I would. Um, yes, exactly. Like say, we've applied for these before, both the city and the county has. And so it's been a very successful program. So really low income people, if they need roofing or insulation or windows replaced. And so, uh, you know, the Upper Cumberland Development District has helped right in and administer the grants in the past. So we've, we've, uh, an excellent job in, in doing those uh, over the years, so I would recommend that we do that again. Thank you. And since there will be no money uh, involved in this, we'll do a voice vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of the court. Next up is item number four, resolution number five 2020, uh, in support of the Second Amendment, and that is Commissioner Scott Rubley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will go ahead and read this resolution as it stands. Uh, it says, whereas the vast majority of the citizens of Warren County, Tennessee, and the legislative body of Warren County, Tennessee, state and accept true as, as true the following. The Declaration of Independence states that people are endowed by their creator. And uh, there's a correction there. Creator has got a small C, and I intended that to have a large C, uppercase. But with inalienable rights, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their power from the consent of the governed. And whereas natural law rights given to each of us by our Creator are the basis of our Constitution by which they are protected and secured to each of us. Natural law rights, including that of self-protection, not given or granted by, but are guaranteed by our laws, our history, and our traditions. And whereas the Constitution of the United States of America is the supreme law of our nation, whereas political resistance against arbitrary power and oppression is the obligation of every patriot, as not to do so is destructive to good and happiness of mankind. In fact, it is the duty of the people of Warren County, Tennessee, through the actions of their lesser magistrates, namely local elected officials and sheriff, to politically challenge the civil government when and where it exceeds or threatens to exceed its constitutional bounds. And whereas any attempted regulation of the right to keep and bear arms or affiliated firearms rights that violates the second, ninth, tenth, or fourteenth amendment of the U.S. Constitution that violates uh, Article 1, Section 24 and 26 of the Tennessee Constitution, or that violates numerous Supreme Court decisions and declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court of the State of Tennessee or the Supreme Court of the United States of America, shall be regarded by the people of or in Warren County to be unconstitutional, a transgression of supreme law of the land and its spirit of individual sovereignty, and therefore by necessity unenforceable. And whereas the legislators of Warren County, Tennessee hold our oath of office 
to support the Constitution and the United States Constitution, sacred and dear. And as such, the governing body of Warren County, Tennessee will not support unconstitutional acts, laws, orders, mandates, or rules, nor will we authorize or appropriate government funds, resources, employees, agencies, contractors, buildings, detention centers, or offices for the purposes of enforcing or assisting in the enforcement of any element of such state or federal acts, laws, orders, mandates, or rules that have been judiciously determined to be a violation of the Second Amendment to the United States Constitution or Article 1, Section 26 of the Tennessee Constitution, and thereby inferring upon the right of the people to keep and bear arms as defined and described in detail above. And whereas the term sanctuary county shall be defined as a county that will always support and defend the rights and liberties of the citizens which are protected by the Second Amendment to the United States Constitution and Article 1, Section 26 of the Tennessee Constitution, Sanctuary County should not be implied to define Warren County as a safe haven for criminals, but rather a safe haven to protect law-abiding citizens from tyranny of overreaching governments and unconstitutional laws that infringe on one's liberty, assets, and freedoms. Now, for, now, therefore, let it be resolved by the county legislative body of Warren County, Tennessee, meeting in regular session this 18th day of February 2020, that Section 1, the, that Warren County, Tennessee, is officially de declared a Second Amendment sanctuary county that recognizes the inalienable rights of the people to possess and bear arms as defined above. Section 2 that should any provision of this resolution be judiciously determined to be unconstitutional, then the unconstitutionality of such provisions shall not affect the enforceability of the remainder of this resolution. Section 3, that upon passage, this resolution shall be forwarded to the General Assembly, Assembly of the State of Tennessee, and that this resolution shall be affected upon passage, the welfare of the county requiring it, uh, Mr. Chairman, this passed policy and personnel 4-0, I think, and I so move. We have a motion. Second. We have a second by Commissioner Stout. Anyone want to speak to that motion? Sure. Commissioner Hennessy. Mr. Ridley, thank you for bringing this in front of us. One of the things that I've discovered during the process of this is there's a lot of great individuals that are in this room today they have reached out to me and had conversation and enlightened me on things that I wasn't aware of before. And I thank you for that. That is democracy and work, folks. That is a great thing to be accomplished, and I applaud you for that. The only question I have here, Mr. Rubley, one of the things that was brought up from the meeting, the committee meeting the other night, was the resolution uh, or the legislation that has passed in the state of Virginia. And I had conversation with Mr. Uh, uh, Jeremy uh, about some of the topics. And, and I truly understand there are areas that are being discussed that warrant concern uh, as a carrier of a firearm or an owner of a firearm. I, I truly understand that. And I'm like you, I would have issue with that myself. I truly support the Second Amendment. But one of the things we have to remember when I was a youngster, I could walk into the school and not be greeted by an armed patrolman because of the environment that we live in today. That's just an unfortunate circumstance that we're actually standing here having this conversation. But my question to you is, to capitalize this as a sanctionary city, does that mean that you're completely and adamantly against any gun control whatsoever? That's all I have to say. Thank you. No, sir. What this does say is that we support the Constitution. If the Constitution changes, uh, it's our sworn oath of office as a commissioner of this county to enforce anything that or, or to um, defend the Constitution. And if the Constitution changes, then it's our sworn oath to defend that. So, no, not, if, if laws change, it's our responsibility to abide by those laws. But I think with the people that show up here tonight are in support of of laws and traditions that have been on books for years and years and years. And, you know, because of the actions of a few, uh, many people are, are sacrificing some of their freedoms because of that. And I, I would be all for uh, 
gun legislation that were effective, but we've proved time and time again in some of our major metropolitan areas that just because there are more laws implemented, that doesn't mean we're solving any problems. But no, I, I'm, I'm not saying that we would revolt against our government should they change the laws. The law is the law, and that's what we've got to abide by, and no matter what. Mr. Savage. Mr. Chairman, uh, I would like to clarify this with our county attorney that any misspelled word or a word or a capital letter should be used. It shall not change the meaning or legality of the resolution. So the, the question is if a word is misspelled or capitalized when it should be not capitalized or vice versa, Will that change the legality? No, I, I do not believe that it will change the legality. I think as long as the intent of the resolution is understood, then it will stand. Right, Thank you. Anyone else want to speak to the motion? Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Brown. Um, Scott, are you aware that some people interpret sanctuary county as meaning that they are protected from having to follow the laws? The gun laws that are, will be if new ones are passed down. That's one of the problems that I have with the term sanctuary county. I'm definitely in support, in support of the Second Amendment, and the other resolution was just to say in support of the Second Amendment but with removing sanctuary county. It just seems that people, it allows people to interpret the law as they see fit and how it would benefit them and doing what they want to do. And it, it, that concerns me. I'm definitely in support of gun regulations and, and gun, gun laws, but I definitely don't want for them to infringe on our, our rights and to, to come and take our guns away. But I know that I, I personally have, have talked you know, to our sheriff and to other law enforcement officers, and that is a concern that they have, is how people will interpret the term and what it could, what it has implied in other areas. That is my only concern with this resolution. Thank you. Anyone else want to speak to the motion? Mr. Chairman, I call the question. Question's been called. Is there a second? Second. All right, we'll vote. We're going to try a voice vote first. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, we need a voice vote. We're voting on question, not resolution, correct? Yes. We're voting on question. We had a second. Clarification, please. We, we, we had question called, we had a second, and we voted on, se on the question, and we had one no vote, so we'll do a voice vote. I think there was some confusion there, Mr. Chairman. I think you were to try that again. I think everybody thought we were voting on okay. the amendment itself. Well, okay, we'll redo the vote on the question. We have a, a motion and a second for question. Question's been called. Point, point, yeah, what is the question? It means to, to stop debate. Someone has asked to stop the debate. Yes. It's so, so basically, just for clarification, we're going to vote on the question to yes. end debate yes. and then we'll have another vote where we actually vote on the uh, second amendment deal yes correct? yes all right this is a vote on the question all in favor say aye. aye aye any opposed all right that motion passes so we're back on the original motion which is the motion to approve this resolution and we have a second everybody ready okay we're going to try a voice vote on that all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay, we'll do a voice vote. Roll call. Michael Bell? Yes. Carl E. Bolden? Yes. Arlene Brown? No. David Dunlap? No. Randy England? Yes. Deborah Evans? No. Steve Glenn? Yes. Richard Grissom? Yes. Stephen Helton? Yes. Robert Hennessy? Pass. Lori Judkins? Yes. 
Ron Lee. Yes. Gary Martin. Yes. Daniel Owens. Yes. Gary Prater. Yes. Christy Ross. Yes. Scott Rubley. Yes. Tommy Savage. Yes. Tyrone Spartman. Yes. Joseph Stotts. Yes. Philip Stout. Yes. Cole Taylor. Yes. Lane Wilcher. Yes. Can you one more change your vote? Motion passes, 19 yes, 3 no. At this time, I want to explain what we're going to do. We've done it before, but uh, I know it doesn't, it's, it's, it's unusual for it to happen, but I have a resolution to present as a commissioner. And I spoke with Charles Curtis again today about this just to confirm. Uh, and he recommended for me to relinquish the chair, not just in word, but basically physically relinquish the chair. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to release, relinquish the chair to Commissioner Rubley as Chairman Pro Tem as I present this resolution. Okay, this is item five, uh, resolution number six, dash 2020. And I believe that is Commissioner Wilcher. Thank you, Chairman. At this time, I want to read this resolution. A resolution to amend the rules and regulations handbook of the Warren County Animal Control and Adoption Center to include mandatory fees for surrendered animals. Whereas the legislative body of Warren County, Tennessee desires to protect the citizens and animals of Warren County, Tennessee from the dangers of overpopulation of cats and dogs, from the danger of overcrowding of the Warren County Animal Control and Adoption Center, and to reduce the prevalence of abuse and abandonment of cats and dogs, and whereas it is the intent of the governing body of Warren County, Tennessee to implement a requirement of mandatory fees to be collected on surrendered animals within Warren County, Tennessee, and whereas the current edition of the Rules and Regulations Handbook of the Warren County Animal Control and Adoption Center does not include mandatory fees for surrendering of animals and therefore will require amendment. Now therefore, be it resolved by the governing body of Warren County, Tennessee meeting in regular session on this, the 18th day of February 2020, as follows, section one, that Warren County, Tennessee hereby implements a mandatory fee in the amount of $10 to be com collected prior to the acceptance of an animal that is being surrendered to the Warren County Animal Control and Adoption Center. Section two, that Warren County, Tennessee hereby implements a mandatory fee in the amount of $500 to be collected per animal when an animal is dumped for the purpose of being discovered by the Warren County Animal Control Center. Section three, that the handbook of rules and regulations of the Warren County Animal Control and Adoption Center be amended to include the above described fees, which removing or by removing article uh, 14 in its entirety and replacing it with the following amended section, which shall read as follows. Surrendered animals. Warren County control shall not accept surrender of an animal by its owner based solely upon the owner's wishes to no longer care for or maintain said animal. Warren County Animal Control may accept surrender of an animal in extenuating circumstances including but not limited to deterioration of owner's health, residency changes due to owner's deteriorating health, or death of owner. Warren County Animal Control shall collect a fee of $10 per animal surrendered prior to accepting any surrendered animal. Warren County Animal Control may accept puppies and or kittens if satisfactory proof of spaying of the mother cat or mother dog has been shown to and accepted by a Warren County Animal Control officer. An animal surrendered by its owner to Warren County Animal Control may be immediately placed for adoption or humanely destroyed in the discretion of the Warren County Animal Control officer or the officer's designee when the owner a, affirmatively represents that he or she is in fact the legal owner of said animal and B, transfers ownership of said animal to the county. 
Warren County Animal Control shall collect a fee of $500 per animal when the animal is dumped for the purpose of being discovered by the Warren County Animal Control Center, Section 4, that the provisions included above in the amendment to the handbook of rules and regulations of the Warren County Animal Control and Adoption Center are adopted by the governing body of Warren County, Tennessee, Section 5, that this resolution shall take effect from and after its passage, the welfare of the county requiring it. And Mr. Chairman, I want to put that in the form of a motion. We have a motion. Do, we, do I hear a second? Second. second uh, Mr. Dunlap. All right. Is there any discussion? Question. Chair recognizes Commissioner Savage. Commissioner now. Uh, section 2. Will the person responsible for dumping animals be charged accordingly by the law if they're after they've dumped them for animal control? Uh, yes, and of course that goes with any crime that will have to be proven in court. But yes, they will be charged $500 per animal if they're caught dumping them. I would personally like to see this uh, for any person that dumps an animal, whether they're discovered by uh, the animal control or anybody else. If it's proven, I would like to see a fine levied on that person. Thank you. Any more discussion? Chair Nick recognizes Mr. Hilton. I want to say I, I appreciate what this resolution says, and I appreciate the intent of, of this resolution. Uh, as a, a county resident and um, somebody that lives in a rural area, uh, dropping of stray animals is a uh, uh, a problem in our area. Uh, matter of fact, I own six animals, uh, all of them rescue animals, and five of those animals were dropped on me. Now, this is not an invitation to continue that. that. Uh, but um, so you know, obviously, we care about uh, care about those animals. Uh, my concern is that this ten dollar collection fee may encourage more of that because, truth will be known, to catch someone dropping an animal is, is hard. You're on a, a back road where I live in the middle of the night. Somebody open up a door and out it goes. And, and there's no one there to see that particular dropped animal. And so I struggle with section, uh, section one there where it says $10. I'm not sure that that's really going to help that. Furthermore, with section two, uh, the $500 fee, I'm not sure if that's enough. And what I mean by that is you can throw a bottle a Coke bottle out your window and get that kind of fine. And here we're dumping a live animal, an animal that's living and breathing, that needs food and water, and we're saying that it's no more than a bottle of uh, pop that you throw out the window. Uh, and so I, I looked at some of the littering fines, and some of those fines go up to $2,000. So, you know, I, I'm wondering if, if that fine is a little weak. And then uh, it was brought up by another commissioner, I'll let them speak to it if they so choose, but, you know, and this may be a, a legal question as well, to collect this $500, what are we going to do as a county, or how are we going to, who's going to be responsible for collecting that? Is our attorney, as our county attorney, going to have to go do legal fees and be a representation for animal control to collect that $500? And I, I, I invite him to speak to that. Yes, to, to collect this $500 fine, each person charged is going to have to be brought into the Warren County General Sessions Court. They'll have to have a hearing, they'll have to be proven, and then after the judgment's granted, you'll have to collect the money from them as a necessary second step. So there's a lot to the process of getting this money once you've found the person and proven that they're the one that surrendered the animals. Thank you, Mr. Bratcher. Anybody have any more questions for Mr. Bratcher? Yes, Commissioner Sabe. I personally think that a well-placed, well-worded, tastefully worded sign at animal control and literature that would, would explain all the costs of taking in animals would generate more money for this purpose than the $10 fee would because I think it's going to be far and few the people that will voluntarily pay out the $10. Now, some people will give more than that. But I think that a, a nicely worded sign and the literature to go along with it would bring in more money. Thank you. 
Mr. Chairman, if I could. Um, yes, Commissioner. I, I know I've spoke to a lot of people about this, and uh, I've actually had one phone call, and it was it was against it, and then they turned for it after I explained to them. What I think the sense of this is, basically, is putting value to these animals' lives. As we saw last week, to some people, unfortunately, they're garbage. And $10 is, is pretty cheap for an animal, and it's probably too low. But I think we have to start somewhere uh, educating these people uh, that, that do this, that they have value. And there's, there's exemptions to this like anything. Uh, Ms. Sherry, uh, I talked with her uh, yesterday, uh, and, and she still believes this is the direction we need to go. And as, as the director telling us that, I would have to, to say that she probably knows what she's talking about. And I agree. Uh, we have to put a value on these, on these animals. And we, I've been doing this for 10 years. I've been on this committee for 10 years. And uh, I can tell you what we've been doing. It, doesn't, it hasn't worked yet, as was evidenced last week. And that's just one situation that we know of. I know there was another one where there's actually more animals dumped than just those three. So um, is it a perfect resolution? I don't think there ever is a perfect resolution, but I think it starts to put value on these animals' lives. And I hope that it will pass. I'm sorry, sir. You have to be recognized prior to the meeting to be eligible to vote. It's kind of taking... Some of the people had uh, the people that have spoken notified the county executive prior to the meeting, and that's that's the rule that we have. I'm sorry. Uh, is there any more discussion before we vote? Yes, Miss Commissioner. Ed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Blaine, I I was fully on board with you 100 percent, and I still feel that way. But since we passed it in committee, I've had four rural commissioners reach out to me. I live in the city, so I didn't realize how much of a problem it is for them to have animals dumped. Is there a way that they, they could not have to pay the $10? Because they're, they're being responsible by notifying animal control. It's not fair to penalize them for irresponsible owners. Right, and I'll just address that real quick. If you, this has nothing to do with if you see some, like, like any of us do, if we see an animal walking down the road and we don't know whose it is, we call them and tell them we're going to bring it in. This is not the type of surrender we're talking about. Okay, we're not, that's not, that's a good Samaritan. Is there any more discussion? Yes, Commissioner Brown. Commissioner Wilshire, has there been any cities that have given you statistics that said that once they instituted this type of fee, that there has been um, a significant change in the number of animals that were dropped off? No, the, the main information that we've got obviously is from other areas that are larger than ours and they charge up to, up to 100 plus for surrenders and they're probably doing it more or less basically because of the finances of actually having these animals uh, get their shots and be fixed. We don't have that issue. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've already had uh, money donated toward this and it hadn't passed yet for people that would actually help pay the surrender fees. So I, we don't have an issue with people giving in this community, so I don't think it's going to be an issue as far as, as the money. Uh, we've not even really looked at that. Um, I, I wasn't talking about money. I said the significant number reduced uh, drop-offs because well, and that's what I meant. I meant they're not look they weren't looking at it for that they were just basically looking at it to try to stay above water with the fees that they were having to come up with from animals that were dumped thank you Commissioner Hill so really and truly this is not about the revenue that we're going to intake it is putting a value on that particular animal's life so I mean ultimately I guess the ten dollars you're talking a thousand dollars, two thousand dollars that we're going to bring in as far as revenue is concerned, which is not that much, really, in the grand scheme of things. One uh, one commissioner did reach, or not commissioner, um, uh, member of the community reached out to me, and they basically indicated that you know they pay taxes and uh, our taxes funds the uh, the uh, animal shelter, and they feel like this is a, a service that we provide, and and so for us to add, add an additional fee to it that uh, they didn't feel that that was right. And that's just a voice that they, they've said. And I don't disagree with that, but those people, including me, were not abusing the system. And this is not to address those people. 
Is there any more discussion? If not, Lisa, please call the roll. Michael Bell? No. Carl E. Bolden? Yes. Carlene Brown? No. David Dunlap? Yes. Randy England? Yes. Deborah Evans? Pass. Steve Glenn? No. Richard Grissom? No. Stephen Helton? Yes. Robert Hennessy? Yes. Lori Judkins? Yes. Ron Lee? No. Gary Martin? No. Daniel Owens? No. Gary Prater? No. Christy Ross? No. Scott Rubley? No. Tommy Savage? No. Tyrone Spartman? Yes. Joseph Stotts? Yes. Philip Stout? Yes. Cole Taylor? No. Lane Wilcher? Yes. Uh, that uh, resolution fails, uh, so we have one pass. Which is so that will be uh, 13 to 10, that resolution fails. At this time, I'll yield the chair back to Chairman Wiltshire. Next item is item number six, and that's consideration of the Criminal Justice Committee. Commissioner Stephen Helton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, wanted to give a little back history of how we got to where we are with this particular uh, resolution. Uh, basically, the legislative body has asked us as a, a committee to turn in our duties and responsibilities. Once County Corrections did that, we turned it over and we passed uh, what we thought our duties and responsibilities were. We passed that along to the legislative committee. Uh, at that point, they reviewed it and, uh, and it was brought up that County Corrections Partnership is technically a uh, special committee and uh, it was uh, giving them a little bit of trouble within the bylaws of what they're currently trying to do and the discussion during the legislative committee basically said well you know we feel like this committee should be a standing committee ultimately we've got a jail uh, we've got a criminal justice system that uh, is in place and uh, we're always going to have this we've had it for 20 something years let's see what it would take to have um, it become a standing committee and they vote unanimously to send it to full court. Uh, unfortunately last month I did not get it here because I just didn't have enough time to prepare it. At that point uh, we brought it back uh, to the f uh, commission, or not the commission, uh, the committee, the uh, County Corrections Partnership Committee uh, did revise that document slightly because we sort of changed gears uh, to, from making it what the committee was into making it a standing committee. Ultimately, uh, I presented the document in which you see uh, in front of you in this packet uh, to that committee. We read over it, we looked at it, and we adopted that and sent it here to full court unanimously. Now, um, basically, I'll uh, read over this and so that uh, everybody understands. Uh, the Criminal Justice Committee, the mission statement. To aid and assist the criminal justice uh, system stakeholders of Warren County to properly maintain and ensure uh, Warren County Jail meets state and national standards. Also facilitate opportunities for inmate education, treatment, and reform. Be a liaison between the stakeholders and the criminal justice system of Warren County to the county commission. Bullet point one. Uh, the chairman of the committee will preside over committee meetings and present to the county court when needed or requested. The elected vice chair will fill the, for the chairman when absent or requested. The recording secretary will be responsible for accurate reporting of the committee meeting notes and provide a record of attendance to the county executive's office. All requesting members must go through uh, all requested meetings must go through the county executive's office for proper publication and notification. 
will review the annual budget for the Warren County Jail and make any recommendations, concerns, and or suggestions to Budget and Finance Committee. During the physical year, if any budget amendments are needed for the jail, the committee will review and make their recommendations, concerns, and or suggestions to Budget and Finance Committee. Maintain communication with the local criminal justice system. Review and report to full commission any jail issues such as, but not limited to, population, repairs, maintenance, data storage files, uh, mental health and substance abuse programs, education programs, ministry, staff issues. Work with stakeholders to formulate a plan to address immediate and future needs of the jail. Assist with developing time frames and, and priorities. Assist jail in maintaining jail certification. Assist in reviewing of inmates' concerns or liabilities. Encourage stakeholders such as district attorney, public defenders, judges, county clerks, probation, sheriff, city police, county executive, city mayor, etc., in the criminal justice system with this uh, criminal justice committee. Review data provided by stakeholders to identify trends and needs for the criminal justice system. Allow and encourage collaboration with probation, adult recovery, juvenile court, 10 rocks, legal professionals, law enforcement, community representatives, and other entities. This committee will automatically represent the County Commission for County Corrections Partnership Initiative and assist stakeholders in identifying any grant opportunities. Now, obviously, uh, those are the responsibilities in the mission statement that we come forward with. And I know I want to go ahead and answer a few questions that have been uh, presented to me so that maybe we can help uh, expedite the, the debate tonight. Um, so, criminal justice is a, a, a national issue, and um, and it's a growing thing. President Trump talked about it in his speech. Uh, uh, Governor Lee talked about it in his as well, and even our own county mayor, our county executive, uh, has a criminal justice task force which addresses it. Now, I realize that we have a criminal justice task force and this criminal justice committee that is two separate entities. Ultimately, what we're trying to do and what we've been trying to do with the legislative committee, which uh, Commissioner Brown is part of, is to lay forth a blueprint for our county to go by for future generations. You know, ultimately, we're all one, uh, one election away from not being here anymore, and so we're trying to put forth a blueprint for other counties to, or for, for our other commissioners uh, to follow in our absence. Um, with that being said, the Criminal Justice Task Force, which um, Executive Haley has, that is with his administration. The next administration may not uh, decide to go forward with that, and so I feel like this is important to put this in place. Uh, and I, I feel like we work directly with those, those two entities. One question has been, what happens to our uh, current county corrections partnership. If you'll notice on the last bullet point of this particular document, you, you see this committee will automatically represent the County Commission for County Corrections Partnership Initiative. Ultimately, it's a consolidation, or at least that's, that's the way I interpret it. Um, it is not two separate committees. It, it would be one committee. Um, the question has been about you know pay and the extra money that it's going to cost the taxpayers because now we have an additional committee. To me, it's one committee. Um, and uh, and it's, it's not uh, an additional committee. Uh, it was brought up in actually the legislative committee, and I think either Christy, uh, Commissioner Ross or, or Commissioner Lee brought this up, and I can't remember which one did. But they said that our county corrections technically is supposed to have other members serving on it, such as judges, lawyers, uh, things of that nature. Uh, and, and the way that we've got it set up, they're, they're not that way. Basically, we set a five-member board, and that five-member board reports that. So my thinking is this actually opens that up to have other members uh, participate in that county corrections partnership. I did reach out to Bob Bass, and I asked the question, what happens when we rename this? What happens whenever we change this? And uh, his statement to, to me in the email that I've got um, is basically the name change affects our relationship nothing. We're still under a plan of action. We're still working with y'all. We'll still come in and, and deal. Basically, the, the fact that we call this a criminal justice committee does not affect that at all. Furthermore, um, I know that there's been uh, some concerns. Uh, actually, uh, uh, Major Walker, he sent out an email regarding this particular committee. And he said that the Sheriff's Department actually works on a lot of this different stuff and, and works on it on a daily basis. And, and it's sort of redundant to have a, have a committee from the commission to do this as well. 
Well, I hope, and, and I did speak with him and had a great conversation with him and, um, and, and definitely seen his points. I hope the Sheriff's Department's doing that. I hope a lot of people are doing that. My point being is this commission or this committee is not trying to take over anything. Please keep in mind how many times you see the word assist in this or help or um, collaboration. It's basically a connection point, a liaison uh, to between the stakeholders, which is anybody in the criminal justice system, to this commission. And the information that we're getting from, from them to us so that we can make educated decisions. Ultimately, my goal is to make this a, uh, a, a committee that is proactive versus reactive. And I think we've been reactive in this commission for, for way too long, and we, we've, we've started being proactive, we've started being educated on this program, and that's the reason I feel like this particular committee or commission it, and committee is important to our um, uh, commission. So with that, I move that we create the Criminal Justice Committee as a standing committee with the mission statement and duties that are presented within your packet. I so move. We have a motion by Commissioner Helton. We have a second by Commissioner Bolden. Would anybody like to speak to that motion? <coughs> Executive Haley. As you know, and as, as Commissioner Helton referred to, we already have a criminal justice task force. It can continue on through administrations. Uh, our CCP already is in place and does all the duties and responsibilities for a plan of action. We have also a safety committee, which has addressed most of these issues over the years. The criminal justice system is ever evolving. And so many of the things that are outlined in Mr. Helton's uh, duties and responsibilities to assist uh, actually are giving oversight that is either the prerogative of the sheriff or of the criminal justice players, including judges. Uh, I would like for Mr. Helton, if he's had support from all the players within the criminal justice system, and I would like to ask Sheriff Myers if he has the support of changing this committee to, uh, to give these duties and responsibilities to yet another committee for you to have to attend. Ladies and gentlemen of the court, I, this is very hard to give you a short answer, but uh, you know, as, as, as your sheriff and the past chief deputy, I've been in the sheriff's department for 30 years, as you know, we have always, uh, you know, presented our issues to the safety committee uh, since I was elected. I've been presenting our issues to two committees, and just the short answer to this is I don't think it's needed at this time. Not to say that it may not in the future, but I would say no. I've also talked to the judges, the district attorneys, and I have garnered no support from them for the changing of the committee that has been his responsibilities are already outlined by TCA and the, the creation of the County Corrections Partnership Committee. And so, what we've been doing with the criminal task force has been proactive it has been and we have been bringing these things to the county's attention once those things are in place and our plan of action that's been accepted by tca and and uh commissioner prater you sit now on the the state tci board uh you sit with commissioner parker uh, so you're well aware of the situations that all counties are facing and so you know creating another committee to address something that's already being corrected or being addressed to me is, is somewhat redundant. I do appreciate uh, the zeal that Mr. Helton has had as a champion of criminal justice reform across the county, um, but neither myself nor any commissioner on this board has any authority to tell a judge, to tell the district attorney, the public defender, the public prosecutor, or the sheriff, or any other person that's engaged in the criminal justice system what to do on a daily basis. Uh, it is not within our prerogative. Even my criminal justice task force is merely basically by choice. Anybody can choose not to participate, and so it's, it's purely a volunteer organization. Uh, we have got together, we have planned, we have talked, we have debated, and much of what has been discussed is what I brought back to the county to vote on for our criminal justice reform including additional officers and other changes, particularly with reentry programs. And so those things have been initiated. The grants that have been written, it's either been myself or under the advice of the Criminal Justice Task Force that we've already gotten. Uh, I'd like to ask Commissioner Helton how many grants that the CCP has written or 
asked for over the last year and a half? Uh, obviously, uh, you know the answer to this. I don't believe that uh, this committee actually has worked directly to write any specific ones, but I do believe that uh, Commissioner Joseph has worked, and I'll let him speak more directly to that about trying to identify some. And I believe through this organization or this committee that we have been able to get uh, services rendered to the Sheriff's Department and things of that nature. And Joseph, if you would like to speak toward that, I would appreciate it. Commissioner Stotts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, several different things. Um, first of which would be, I do feel like that um, over the last year, there was some initiation by the, by the committee to initiate grants, specifically with the drug court. Um, I know we met personally, myself and you several times to discuss those and we met with Mr. Price. Uh, so as far as the committee's, um, what would you say, um, attempt to initiate uh, grant opportunities, I think that that did happen. Um, I also think that um, I also feel like that as Commissioner Helton has stated, there has been increased emphasis placed on criminal justice reform by the federal government. There's been increased emphasis placed on criminal justice reform by the state and Governor Lee. Um, the need to do things differently, I think, is there. When we were all were elected back in August, we had a large cap at the jail that had to be addressed. Now, I don't know about anybody else that works in management at their place of employment, but I know myself that if I have to address a corrective action plan at my place of employment, Obviously, one of the things I have to do first is make sure that the items that's been listed on that corrective action plan are addressed and taken care of. But then what I also have to look at is why did it occur to begin with? Why did I have a cap? So, you know, I relook at my staff, I retrain staff, or reshuffle staff around. Uh, we obviously had a lot of issues that we inherited last August. So, you know, I would question the county executive on if things have be, went the way that they were supposed to, why do we have such a large cap? I don't understand your question. My question is, you're saying you feel like that there's not increased oversight needed in the commission's role in the government of this county for criminal justice reform, but yet we had a large cap last August when this, when this committee had not met, somebody feel free to correct me for over a year, and the intent if I, Mr. Helton can correct me if I'm wrong, is for this committee to meet more often to prevent future caps, prevent future errors from occurring. And this, this isn't just about the jail. This is about, as Commissioner Helton said, this is about the entire county. It's about, it's about probation. It's about um, the drug court. It's about facilitating and helping and assisting. It has nothing to do, from my perspective, about managing anybody's budget or being in charge of anything. So again, my question to you is, are you saying that you feel like that before last August everything was going well in regards to the problems that occurred at the jail, which successfully has been addressed by your administration and our current sheriff, who's doing a wonderful job? But so are you saying there's not, you don't feel like there's more oversight needed from a standpoint to facilitate and increase efforts throughout the county for criminal justice, although we had a cap? I don't know what you mean by oversight. Uh, when I talked to Bob Bass and Charles Curtis both, oversight by a commission on an elected official uh, is not supposed to... I'm not referring to elected official. So you're talking about oversight of the jail budget? No, I'm not talking or about you the jail budget. oversight of me? I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about to facilitate and assist the county in a collaborative effort for criminal justice. So does the CCP not already do that? Does the safety committee not no, already the do way, that? The way that the CCP is set up is it's a reactive committee. To a problem, to address a problem, and then go dormant. That's what several commissioners have, commissioners have stated, correct? A plan of action is the duties and responsibilities of CCP, it is. So would you also concur that if we had a problem in the educational system of Warren County, that we only need an education committee if there's a problem? Otherwise, it shouldn't exist? It's the education. Along with the highway committee, along with the animal control committee and the agriculture committee. 
All these committees, should they only exist if there's a problem? Should they only be reactive, in your opinion? The safety committee does what they're supposed to do with the jail already. Education committee, we don't have a larger committee that involves all those players. That's what the school board does. I think the education committee does an excellent job as being a liaison between the school board That's, and the superintendent. And so, I agree. And we do. I agree. Executive Haley, I'd like to make a statement as a fourth district commissioner. Um, I can say that uh, I can see a noticeable difference uh, as being a commissioner on my third term. Um, I spoke to a number of commissioners and we didn't really know much about what was going on, on at the jail for years. And I'm not, I'm not uh, giving credit to Stephen uh, or just Tommy, but I can tell you that this committee has, I've been more knowledgeable of what's going on out at the jail the last year, year and almost two years now than I've ever been. And I wonder how many times the safety committee goes to the jail. I don't know. Uh, I mean, maybe they go every month, I don't know. But I know they meet at the jail and I can find out what's going on monthly. And I don't have to wait and wonder uh, until budget time. So that has been a very, very big plus to me as a commissioner. Uh, one thing I would like to clear up is ultimately um, no committee is over Bobby Cox or, or Sheriff Myers or anything. Basically, if if that elected official doesn't want to come to a meeting or they don't want to participate, uh, they don't have to. That's their 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 right. Uh, that's the reason you're going to see the words assist uh, and engage. Um, and so I think there's a little bit of a misconception here that you know we're going to be over something or we're going to be in charge of. Uh, that is not the, the case. Basically, what I'm looking at here is being that, that connection to our commission. That's what I feel like we've been doing over the last year and a half uh, to two years, and, and that's what I think that we want to continue to do. As far as to answer Executive Haley's um, uh, point of no judges or nobody wants this help. Um, I actually uh, met with uh, Judge Stanley and uh, also the Drug Court Program, and uh, this is the email I've got from them. As per our meeting today with Judge Stanley, you and myself, this is a recap of our conversation. Having the Adult Recovery Program collaborate with the Criminal Justice Committee appears to be something which would benefit the Adult Recovery Program and Warren County. Having a committee which would be in tune with the Adult Recovery uh, accomplishments and failures would only enhance the overall objective of the adult recovery program to promote health, safety, and welfare of our community and the participants by reducing the number of drug-related reoffenders through enhancing supervision, treatment, and education. The adult recovery program is open to any department in within Warren County to review all data associated with our program and open to suggestions for improving the adult recovery court program. Along with that, uh, I was able to speak with uh, Mr. Dishman today, and uh, his official quote is, we are welcome to anything that would aid in the people uh, that we are sworn to, to serve. Um, unfortunately, I did not get around to talk to every single judge or every single individual within the ju uh, criminal justice uh, or committee, a com um, community. Um, but ultimately, what my goal, uh, as far as this committee is, is just to have that connection point. If you look in the mission statement of what we've got, it says liaison. It's not that I want to try to be over Sheriff Myers, and Sheriff Myers has done a fantastic job. Miss Jackie's done a fantastic job, and I feel like that our committee has worked really hard to help them and assist them. And if I'm wrong in that, I, I, I challenge them to jump up and stand up right now and say we haven't been. But that, that work is what I want to see continue, and I, I feel strongly about this. Mr. Brown. What, what, what I'm actually hearing is that we all recognize the major steps that have been accomplished in the past couple of years at our jail. And I know that one of the things that enabled that was a budget that funded many things that we didn't have before and the loan we took out. If you remember, we have used money in, in that. Um, so it enabled us to start some of those projects. The hard work of your committee, working with the staff, Mr. Haley, you, Mr. Bass, to, you can name 25 people quickly who, who were part of making all that happen. But what I really hear is 
we have a duplication here of the responsibilities of the safety committee, a duplication of some of the responsibilities of the criminal justice task force, and um, also duplication of what was uh, the county commission, county corrections partnership and force committee. So how do we go about fixing that it, where it's we don't have these duplications because I think everybody's on board with wanting to continue to improve and have a better criminal justice system for Warren County. But how do we go about doing that and not be duplicating what different people are doing and wa wasting time, maybe is, is a terminology to put there, but how do we fix this is what I, I'd like, I think that's what we gotta go back to is you, you have written a, a excellent description of things that you'd like to see accomplished and others feel like they're already working on those things and maybe somehow or another it's like we need to revisit this one more time. Commissioner Prater. Speaking with Bob Bass, Bob Bass told me that that committee and Chairman Hilton had done a fantastic job. He said they have done a great job out there. But at the same time, he also said that committee was not set up to be a ongoing committee, but could be made a standing committee by the county court. Now, I remember some time years ago, we had a jail oversight committee. I sat on that jail oversight committee. We met once a month out there about eight o'clock every Tuesday or Wednesday morning. And um, that's what we always had a jail oversight committee up until a couple of years ago, and then it become a partnership committee. So maybe we need to be looking at the jail oversight committee again. Commissioner Hansen. Briefly. We sat in the legislative committee meeting, and unfortunately, Carl's not here tonight to, to enlighten us with what he had enlightened. Everybody here is what he had done for us. But it is recorded in the minutes, the discussion that he had. In front of me, I've got a copy of the mission statement that Mr. Carl D. Bolden said that that would be a good way to start this. And it's, it's very limited as, as to what, in comparison to Mr. Helton's. And also, he said the same thing that Mr. Prater said about the uh, development of that particular committee being, a, being an oversight or, or a temporary standing or uh, special committee. But basically, it raised review and report to full commission any jail issues such as, but not limited to, population repairs, maintenance, data storage files, mental health, substance abuse programs, educational committee, ministry, staffing issues, assisting jail and maintaining jail certification. And that was the whole thing behind this committee being started with in the first place. I just thought it was important to bring that to everybody's attention. Mr. Bolton was not there at the time that everybody took the vote to go ahead and move forward with this initiative. And uh, that was what he brought to us during that meeting. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Bell. I have a statement from Mr. Carl Bowden that he sent me today. He has the flu is the reason why he's not here tonight. And on, on Mr. Helton's statement, he says, I do not support Stephen Helton's resolution as written, is what Mr. Carl D. Bowden wrote to me, to, if it come up to be spoke about. Commissioner Ross. Um, I too reached out to some of the stakeholders and um, and I spoke with Judge Stanley and he said though he's willing to help anybody. He, he General Sessions Judge Bill Locke, Mayor Ben Newman, District Attorney Lisa Zavigianis and others all said they were on the record as saying this is not needed. It's not beneficial and that we should listen to what the sheriff wants. He was elected. It's his job to take care of the jail and the sheriff's department. We are only there in a budgetary sense. Otherwise, all of this is, in my opinion, it, it's, it's a mute point. He's told us what, what he wants to do. We don't have any authority over that sheriff, period. 
and yet we're sitting here beating ourselves up for nothing. I yield to the chairman. Commissioner Stotts. I'd just like to clarify one point. Um, this, this has absolutely nothing to do from my perspective at all about being over anyone. It also doesn't have anything to do about being over a budget. It is a more collective effort to look at the community and look at the needs of the entire community related to criminal justice. It's not just about the jail. That's why we get in these predicaments to begin with. It's not, criminal justice reform is not just about a jail. It's not just about catch and release. It's about being proactive and looking at all these problems as they occur daily and trying to find solutions for them. And you know what the definition of insanity is? Doing the same things over and over and over again, expecting different results. And I'm just saying right now, uh, I, I respect the sheriff. He is doing a phenomenal job. This has nothing to do with what he's doing or not doing or any other, the other stakeholders. It just simply is saying again, with county, the county executive has a criminal justice task force. That is wonderful. That may or may not continue. We're, we're simply uh, looking at, the commission is looking at putting in place a safeguard that the commission will always be involved and always have a committee there to ensure that the county has criminal justice reform at the forefront as, been, as, as has been identified by the government at the federal and state level. Thank you. Commissioner Evans. I'm really sorry, Commissioner Bell, when this heater starts running, I can't hear. And I want to clarify, did you say that Commissioner Carl T. Bowden does not support? Okay, and another point I wanted to make, what I'm hearing is good intentions from Commissioner Elton and Commissioner Stotts. I, I have a couple issues with Commissioner Stotts being on the committee because of his employment as a possible conflict of interest. I have an issue with Commissioner Elton being on it. As you all know, he voted no to everything our sheriff and jail administrators said they needed. Several people on that committee voted no. So I hear you saying you want to assist the sheriff and the stakeholders and all the professionals have very politely said thank you for your offer but we really don't want it. It's just really, it's bureaucracy for them. For them to have to report two and three times when these, some of these things you want to do are already being done by the task force and or by the safety committee. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I don't think this has anything to do with who did or did not vote on a budget. That should have been, that, that should be dismissed from right now. Okay. That has nothing to do with how anyone voted. Commissioner Stotts. I just want to, I have a question from Commissioner Evans. I just want to clarify. So Commissioner Evans, are you saying that since I have 16 years experience working in the field of mental health and criminal justice, I shouldn't be on a criminal justice committee? Not at all. I'm saying because you work for a local company who was volunteering their services there, it can be perceived as a conflict of interest. Mr. Yes. Chairman, I, I yes, think all for the question. It's been enough debating. All right, we've got a call for question. We have a second by Commissioner Grissom. All in favor on the vote for question, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. So we're ceasing debate on this, and we will go to the vote. And I think we'll just go ahead and do a voice vote. Roll call, I'm sorry. No. Carl E. Bolden? Yes. Carl E. Brown? No. David Dunlap? No. Randy England? Yes. Deborah Evans? No. Steve Glenn? No. Richard Grissom? No. Stephen Helton? Yes. Robert Hennessy? No. 
Ron Lee? No. Gary Martin? No. Daniel Owens? No. Gary Prater? Yes. Christy Ross? No. Scott Rubley? Pass. Tommy Savage? No. Tyrone Spartman? Yes. Joseph Stotts? Yes. Philip Stout? Yes. Cole Taylor? No. Wayne Wilcher? Yes. Anyone want to change your vote? Mr. Chairman, before we go on, can we take a minute, uh, about a 10 minute break or seven, eight minute break, please? Uh, yes, we'll, we'll have a five minute recess. All right, we've got everybody back, so we'll go back in session. The uh, next item up is item number seven, and that is a transfer GFFY 19 slash 20 dash nine. And that is the sanitation, or I'm sorry, that is the budget transfer to re reallocate funds for the county clerk from clerical personnel to data processing equipment for the one-time purchase of computers due to security support for Windows 7, the operating system of the computers coming to an end by Microsoft. So move. We have a motion from Commissioner Bell. Second. We have a second from Commissioner Owens. Call the roll, please. Michael Bell. Yes. Carl E. Bolden? Yes. Item is item number eight, amendment SFFY 19 slash 20 dash one. The sanitation fund budget amendment will add funds to site development 25,360 and solid waste equipment 8,000 offset by an increase in sale of the equipment 33,360. Move to adopt. We have a motion by Commissioner Rubley, a second by Commissioner Glenn. Anybody want to speak to that motion? Call the roll, please. Michael Bell? Yes. Yes. Carlene Brown? Yes. David Dunlap? Yes. Randy England? Yes. Deborah Evans? Yes. Steve Glenn? Yes. Richard Grissom? Yes. Stephen Helton? Yes. Robert Hennessy? Yes. Lori Judkins? Yes. Ron Lee? Yes. Gary Martin? Yes. Daniel Owens? Yes. Christy Ross? Yes. Scott Rubley? Yes. Tommy Savage? Yes. Tyrone Spartman? Yes. Joseph Stotts? Yes. Philip Stout? Yes. Cole Taylor? Yes. Lane Wilcher? Yes. Anyone want to change your vote? 22 yes. Motion passes 22 to 0. Next item is item number 9, amendment GP-FY 19-20-2, general purpose schools amendment to increase textbooks, $530,000 line item, transfer funds from pre-K regular instruction equipment to transportation, 12,500 except healthier Tennessee grant 1,000 and except energy right money $33,145. Move to adopt. We have a motion from Commissioner Stout. We have a second from Commissioner Judkins. Anyone want to speak to that motion? Call the roll. Michael Bell? Yes. Carl E. Bolden? Yes. Carlene Brown? Yes. David Dunlap? Yes. Randy England? Yes. Deborah Evans? Yes. Steve Flynn? Yes. Richard Grissom? Yes. Stephen Hilton? Yes. Robert Hennessy? Yes. Lori 
Marjorie Judkins? Yes. Ron Lee? Yes. Gary Martin? Yes. Daniel Owens? Yes. Christy Ross? Yes. Scott Rubley? Yes. Tommy Savage? Yes. Tyrone Spartman? Yes. Joseph Stott? Yes. Philip Stout? Yes. Cole Taylor? Yes. Blaine Wilcher? Yes. Anyone more change your vote? 22 yes. Motion passes 22 to 0. Next item is item number 10. That is amendment GP-FY19-20-3, general purpose schools amendment to accept Ag Barn donations, 41,500, a side match of Ag Barn donations, 41,500, accept Spark Grant, 36,000, accept early post-secondary expansion grant, 10,000, and accept <laughs> middle school CTE startup grant, 10,000. Move to adopt. I have a motion by Commissioner Rubley. Second by Commissioner Owens. Anyone want to speak to that motion? Call the roll. Michael Hill? Yes. Carl E. Bolden? Yes. Carlene Brown? Yes. David Dulap? Yes. Rain England? Yes. Deborah Evans? Yes. Steve Flynn? Yes. Richard Grissom? Yes. Stephen Helton? Yes. Robert Hennessy? Yes. Lori Duckins? Yes. Ron Lee? Yes. Gary Martin? Yes. Daniel Owen? Yes. Christy Ross? Yes. Scott Ridley? Yes. Tommy Savage? Yes. Tyrone Spartman? Yes. Joseph Stotts? Yes. Philip Stout? Yes. Cole Taylor? Yes. Blaine Wilcher? Yes. Anyone more change your vote? 22 yes. Motion passes 22 to 0. Next up is our approval of notaries, item number 11. for the notaries. Ethan M. Bandy, Sheila J. Cantrell, Samantha Earls, Kathy Fan, Andrea James, Amanda King, Sonia Ramirez, Mara Wanamaker, Brenda Carrite, Rosemarie Myrtle McDonald, Jean M. Brock, Lindell Jones, Philip W. Carter, and Emily S. Casey. We have a motion by Commissioner Bell, second by Commissioner England. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Next is our special presentation, Executive Haley. It was supposed to have been three presentations. Uh, Ian Raleigh was supposed to be here about the bike race, but he couldn't be here tonight. I mean, not the bike race, about the bike rack grant that we got. And so that was presented. And so we'll be partnering with the city and uh, also in putting those uh, those racks and, uh, and repair stations around. But we have two presentations tonight. One of them was given uh, before the Education Committee, it was a request that uh, they present to the whole commission about the importance of education. So we have Dana Mulligan and Brent Estes here tonight, and then this will be followed by another presentation that we will discuss here shortly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Um, we are here on behalf of the Smith Education Association, uh, but we're here to just teachers. <laughs> Do I have two minutes? No, you can have longer than two minutes. This is I'll not take public three. You're, you're tired, I know. On March 16th, um, there's going to be a rally in Nashville for education. There's a $6.7 billion surplus from our state. Uh, the rainy day fund is $1.3 billion. And we're like, okay, it's time to give us some of that money. Uh, we deserve it. Our students, uh, the funding is 45th, um, and that's not acceptable. Our kids deserve it. We deserve it. Um, our teachers, you know, they pay out of pocket for all kinds of things. And, you know, the state, you have it with no tax increase. And we want a piece of that. And um, I was talking to a member of our community the other day, and it says, why don't teachers rise up? We're tired. We have been promised, and we've been promised. That I am, this is my 31st year, and I love my job. I love, call Taylor. Mr. Helton, I think I had you too. I don't know. 
It makes me proud you're sitting here. But we have got to take it to them and say, give us this money. Our kids deserve it. We deserve it. And, Chris, we're going for you as well. We are so appreciative of Mr. Cox and our school board. I want to share this very briefly. After you bravely, and I know it was a brave vote, passed that tax increase with my, so I could replace my 2007 windows. I'm still waiting, but I'm excited that computers are in the building. I didn't hear from one soul when they were signing in. We're getting this money, you know, we're celebrating. It was, quote, I feel appreciated as we were signing in that morning. They see me. We are valued. And y'all, that's all that matters. You know, we don't want the little, the little gifts from our kids are sweet. You know, the little mugs and all that stuff. But a thank you. We see you. We see you working hard. And so I'm just here to invite you to go with us. Um, the Tennessee Education Association is providing a charter bus. They're providing us snacks. We're going on the Monday of spring break. We just want you to go with us. Hold up a sign and say, you know, legislature, give us a little bit of money. Help us out a little bit. We talked to Mr. Cox and said, what could we do with an extra $8 million that we don't have to raise taxes for? We could do a lot of things for our kids. And so this is just an invitation to you to come with us. We're going to leave from Warren County High School about 9.30 that morning. We're going to take you to Nashville. We're going to give you some good snacks. I'm taking orders, chocolate, of course. And we just want you to go with us. And that's, that's what I'm asking. But just, again, thank you for your support in education. We feel that. Our kids feel that. And we're just grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. My name is Raymond Roberts. I'm a current fire chief of North Moore Fire Department. 24 years uh, in the volunteer service in this county. I'm also the president of the Warren County Fire Chiefs Association. I come tonight just kind of give you guys an update on our funding. I know a lot of you have heard rumors or stories. I'm going to try to get some of them laid to rest and let you know really what we're working on. In order to continue the growth and the safety of our citizens, we've got to have funding. Uh, currently, as you all know, the county provides $8,000 a year. Uh, and I, I'm speaking for North Moore, and it doesn't cover our insurance just so you know. Uh, what we've looked at, um, I've looked at several counties throughout the state. I've visited uh, Washington County, which is far east um, Tennessee, and they were one of the, the uh, departments that looked at some you know, alternate funding. And, and what we looked at is through uh, our electric cooperative, Caney Ford. Uh, I know you guys have all heard that we want to put a charge on the Caney Ford bill, which is true. I've worked with the other six fire chiefs, and we're looking at adding a $6 fee per month for residential meters. And what this does, this allows the burden to be spread out to not only just your landowners, but the renters too. Because currently the way it goes, the landowner, the homeowner is the person that's responsible to pay a subscription. Uh, you may or may not get that. And the recourse we have now is if we respond to your house, you have a call. Obviously Tennessee is a no, no, no pay, no spray state. There's not a fire department in this county that's not gonna put water on fire. I'm just telling you that. So the only recourse we have is if we, put, we come to your house, we put out your house fire. you got to have a report for about three of the major insurance companies. All these other insurance companies you don't. So in order to get a report, I charge you $500, which is, you know, there's a lot of, hey, if we don't need it, if we do, we'll pay the $500. So what we're proposing or what we're looking at is, is to add this on to the Caddy Ford bills, the electric bills, of all meters throughout the county with the exception of Morrison City Limits because they are exempted. But uh, $6 would fund each of the seven fire departments. And the way we've done it, I got all the fire chiefs together, asked them what they needed for the next five years. Not just to keep the doors open, but to actually act as a fire department. Um, and we've come up with a, a dollar. And, and what we've done is we took the total amount and put out a percentage for each fire department. So the fire departments decided on a percentage. We first thought, hey, we're going to do it by how many meters you got in the area. Uh, but if we do that, our smaller fire departments are, are, are not going to get the funding they need. That didn't work. The second thing was, what is the assessment on the property values in the area? That didn't work. 
you know, we've got some departments that don't have higher assessment. So what we've done is just ask them what they wanted. Ever, all seven fire chiefs, what do you need to operate? And I took that and divided and give them all a percentage. So we come up with $6 a month, and this is just the residential. We're not even talking about commercial at this point, but the residential will fund us, and the amount we get will be five years, and we can actually be proactive. We can actually start getting equipment that's not 30 years old. Uh, we can get equipment that we feel good about sending our firefighters in. You know, um, Mr. Helton, you know sometimes you see firefighters out there and you're like, you can't send them in with what they're wearing. Uh, and you guys all know it, it costs us somewhere in the neighborhood of $5,000 to completely equip a firefighter to go into a house. Um, most of you don't, but if I have a firefighter get, in, get injured, I've got to go to the house and tell them they're injured. And they're not going to be injured because they don't have good equipment. So that's what we're here for. Just wanted to uh, open to you if you got some questions. I mean, we're still very early in this. We've been working on it for six months. Uh, the other options is, and I'm going to go ahead and let you know, it's fire tax. Nobody wants a fire tax. Nobody wants a county fire department. I can tell you the seven chiefs in the county do not want a county fire department. Um, but that was one, one way to do it. The other one is the county just funding us completely. But again, we're going to be a, a county fire department. Nobody wants that. The other way was to do this alternate funding. So we, we run this by CTAS, and they're absolutely in love with it. So I think as we continue to work and maybe have something to present to you in the near future, we would love your support, and if anybody is interested in coming to one of our fire chiefs meetings, you'll get with me. I don't care to invite you and let you see what we're doing. Uh, but there's some good things in the county, and we're working on some good things. But I, I want to stress that this has been the seven fire chiefs. Nobody has been involved in these meetings other than the seven fire departments you have in the county. Mr. Roberts, I, I want to make sure because I'm actually... Sure. I pay dues to, to North Warren, and uh, so that will basically do away with the dues that we pay currently. Yes, the dues will go away, um, and uh, probably your $56,000 that you're giving the seven fire departments will go away as well. But we'll put the burden on the people where it should be. And I'm not trying to, I'm going to be paying mine. You know, everybody will be paying theirs. But as you don't know, if you're in North Warren, and I speak to North Warren, ISO rating is very important when you pay your insurance. Um, and a lot of folks don't know, if you have Farm Bureau, we have a 6Y six, six rating in North Warren. That saves, saves on average of 30% on your homeowner's insurance. Insurance won't tell you that, you've got to bring that up. So what we want to do is once we get the funding and get the equipment for all these fire departments to lower their ISO rating, it's only beneficial to the county and everybody living there. Yes, sir. Question, and this might be more of a question for the manager of County Fort, Mr. Bill sure. Rogers. Is, can he come up? I mean, can I answer this question? Let's just say, I mean, I'm just speaking through Ellicare. I don't, $6 is not a problem for me personally. Some people may not want to pay the $6 a month. If they do not pay that $6, if their bill's 150 bucks, it's going to be 156 If they don't pay that, will their electric be cut off? Uh, Mr. Chairman, would it be all right if I addressed a letter that I wrote to County Executive Haley back in the summer that outlines our requirements for this program? Yes. Okay, and, and Mr. Pryor, let me ask you your question. All right. um, I met with uh, Mayor Haley, or excuse me, County Executive Haley twice about this issue and met with the fire chiefs twice about this issue. And one of the reasons this came up is because we do solid waste billing for uh, both Van Buren and White counties in our service territory. And pretty much what we laid out as a platform for this is the same platform that we laid out for those two counties for those services. There's nine stipulations, take me just a minute to go through those. Number one, the Warren County Commission mandates this fee for all required accounts. There's got to be teeth behind this. This cannot be a voluntary issue, okay? Number two, the Warren County Commission will determine the person, committee, or entity that will be responsible for policing the program and determining if any exemptions will be provided. The Warren County Commission will set the fee and determine if the fees will be differentiated by class, i.e. residential, small commercial, large commercial, etc. County Fork will charge 60 cents per bill per month. That's our service charge for providing the fee. So in the case that uh, Raymond presented, if they charge six, we're going to get 60, they get 540. Okay? And it'd be 660. 
just, just oh, we, as long as as long as this body sets it right, we right. don't we don't care. Right. Okay. Uh, let's see. County Fork will collect the funds, deduct our processing fees, and deposit the balance into the approved bank account once per month via ACH transaction. Here's to your point, uh, Cole. Electric service for Caney Fork members will not be disconnected for failure to pay the fee. Any members that are delinquent on this fee will be reported to the policing entity. If they pay their electric bill to us and stay in good standing as a member of the co-op, then they're in good standing with us. We're not going to pull their meter for failure to pay this fee. That will be up to the county to determine the policing action that will be required by that. Uh, Warren County will be responsible for distributing the collected funds to the volunteer fire departments. In other words, this transaction and all the things around it are, would actually be between County Fork and Warren County and not anything directly with the volunteer fire departments. Okay. And then lastly, uh, no, excuse me, I've got two more. Uh, any funds collected by Caney Fork and paid to Warren County that are determined and made by insufficient means will be reconciled at the appropriate time, and the fees will not be prorated for partial months billing. And the last statement I say is should the Warren County government pass legislation that meets these requirements, then I'll be glad to take that to my board uh, for approval. I've got about a half a dozen copies of this letter if anybody would like to have a copy and see it. And I'll be glad to field any other questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner? Yes. Commissioner Rogers, you made some remarks that you collect money for garbage in White and Pamir. Yes, sir. What kind of participation? Are you getting a good 100%. participation? 100%. I mean, it's mandatory. Well, so, but you're getting good participation there. We should expect maybe the same here. I would hope so. I mean, we have a, we have a few. Now, don't get me wrong. On the front end of this, there's going to be a lot of flack for uh, myself and my staff and a lot of y'all. And, and everybody's got a, a stake in this, okay? We had the same challenges in both Warren and Van Buren County. We got through it. Everybody now accepts it. They understand it. We had one in Van Buren County not long ago challenge it. Uh, his fees actually got to the point, he was paying his electric bill, but his fees got to the point where he was almost ready to be pulled and we realized why. And so we just turned it over to the county to deal with. And, and again, this is an issue between the members of the county for something that's really not our business, but we're glad to, to try to help with this. Does that answer your question, Mr. Lee? Anything? I have a question, Mel. What if, say, a homeowner has more than one meter? Are they going to be charged, every meter is going to be charged $6? Again, that's where the uh, committee or entity that you assigned to this will be in charge of determining if any exemptions exist and why. That's, y again, y'all's decision, not ours. We will help you identify what's residential, small commercial, and large commercial. And we'll help you identify the nature of what's going on, but it would be up to the policing entity to determine whether it's there would be any exemptions allowed. Why well, my question is, there's let a lot speak of that. Before you, let me let me speak that because yeah. we've already discussed this. No, you will not. You'll be charged for one meter. Right. Uh, if you have a milking barn, that's going to be like a commercial, but it's going to be under the usage where you're not going to be charged for that. If you own five houses, you're only going to be charged for that one meter. Now, if you're renting out four of them, your renter's going to, it's going to be in the renter's name, so they'll be charged for it. Well, you take a lot of nursery in this county. The pumps they, are going to be they lower. Pump, they've they got meters for the pumps. They're going to be lower, and they're not going to be charged. Right. Again, those are all stipulations to be determined, I would assume, in conjunction between the fire chiefs and the policing entity that y'all determined for this to go through. And, and we've already done this work yeah. for, for who's going to be exempt. What you know, because we we don't want you guys to have to worry about it. You know, you don't. We're not county. We're not county departments. We need your help with the funding, but there's no sense in you know you having to waste your time there. We have seven fire chiefs that can sit on the committee. If you want to put some in there, that's on you. But we're not going to be a county department I don't, unless you want to fund this fully. And, I, hey, we've talked about. I it. think one of the issues here has to do with this mandating of the fee, and and I'm going to yield to either the county or the county attorney about this. Because y'all don't actually have any jurisdiction as such over them, then I think there's got to be some other things done for this to be able to be mandated. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else that I can address for anyone? 
this is more just in, in general, uh, the importance of this as a, as a rural fire department to hit key on what Ramey is saying. A lot of the fire departments, in case you're not aware of it, they're running 30 year old and plus equipment. And these pieces of apparatus are half million dollar pieces of, uh, of equipment. And to equip them, it costs sometimes even that much, depends on what the, the, uh, the unit is and, and what it's uh, set up for. Most of our units, and I don't know, Ramey, you may have a, a number on that, uh, of how many fire trucks we actually have in the county and how many of those fire trucks are actually, you know, 10 years or older. Yeah, if you look into NFPA standards, we have, I think, three trucks in the county that meet it. So, if, you know, if you look at being, when you're a, a, a volunteer department, it's on the entity, they can give you a little bit of leeway with that NFPA standards. But it, and what me and uh, Executive Heavy were talking about, if it becomes a county fire department, you're going to have to look at putting about 14 to 16, maybe 18 trucks on right away. And like you said, at a quarter of a million dollars. Our newest truck for our department is a 1999. It cost us $90,000 for a strip truck and about $20,000 to equip it just to fight fire. Another $20,000 for extrication equipment. So that's, we're able to do some things, but we are not where we need to be. Anybody want to copy this? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. At this time, we have announcements, and I want to make uh, two announcements. Uh, one for Ashley uh, Bowden, who wasn't able to be here. Uh, she's been working really hard with Sherry and the staff there at the uh, Animal Control and Adoption Center for our uh, next Adopt One uh, day out there on March the 7th. Uh, I know the Adopt One will go from 9 to 11, and I'm not sure how long will the the day last out there, Sherry? Till 2 o'clock, and they're going to have games for kids and uh, things for adults also, and it's just a good time to come out and see what's going on out there. You can sponsor an animal for adoption. Uh, you can walk a dog. You can pet a cat. I mean, you know, they, they believe me, they'll just enjoy you being there, and you'll enjoy being there, so remember that. And uh, also... Uh, this year, the uh, elected officials' day at the Habitat House, which I know Executive Haley is there every Saturday when that thing is getting built. Uh, but if you want to come out and join some of your elected officials, I hope more people on the commission will come. We'll actually be there on April uh, the 4th, and we'll be working that day uh, on different items. But uh, I know Gary at Prater's Barbecue is going to provide us a meal, so you'll get a good meal and you'll get to see some, some people and, and do some good work. So don't forget that day and you've got the information in front of you. Executive Haley. Well, I was going to reiterate the same thing. So we're getting ready to start uh, the newest Habitat House. And so it's a community and volunteer team spirit that really actually makes that happen. And those of you who have been there, you know how it changed the lives of those individuals who receive those homes. And they have to put so many hundred hours into that work as well as a volunteer just in order to qualify for that so the owners are there nearly every Saturday as well and even there when it's not Saturday so we'll be starting here in a couple of weeks I've already laid the foundation in the groundwork so they'll be uh, you know doing a lot of work just in the next couple of weeks to prepare for this so that is but any Saturday uh, starting in the middle of my, uh, March until the, the house is finished usually at the end of June when we have the dedication uh, everyone's welcome uh, to come to bring food uh, to recruit people. So our uh, football team comes, our OTC comes, we have different groups every Saturday that donates their time. Bridgestone, a lot of the industries do as well. That Bridgestone would build one house by themselves basically, right off of Sparta Street. A couple of other things, it's in my notice, but <clears throat> one of them I didn't have the date for, but uh, the uh, TCSA, Tennessee County Service Association, elected officials day in Nashville, will be March 2nd and 3rd. I think March 2nd is a reception that night. And March 3rd is the day on the Hill. Uh, the Chamber's legislative breakfast will be uh, March 27th. And then Bologna Day, uh, which several of you participate in, will be April 7th in Nashville also as well. And just a reminder, um, you know, if those of you, I've had a couple of people just since I announced it, but to announce again that uh, this Saturday will be the uh, second uh, gun carry permit that uh, class that I'm sponsoring, and so uh, Stuart Whitman will be the instructor again. And so there's an online process, I think Treva and Tyrone signed up for it as well. So there's an online process and you have to print out a sheet to take uh, in order to, to get your permit. And the, the shooting portion of the class will usually be right after that weather permitting. So 
Um, nothing else. Thank you. Question. Yes, Commissioner yes. Savage. Uh, if somebody could please put a copy of the uh, County Fort letter that Mr. Rogers had on the county's website, and we can just all print it off then. We can send it out to you. Okay. Commissioner Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm not necessarily sure that this is a that I, I have to announcement, but I want to announce it myself because I've had some questions from some of the people of the county, and I've already reached out to a few of the commissioners and stuff. Uh, last Tuesday, we had a building and grounds meeting, and the reason I'm announcing this is because I want to announce it to the county. So I'm going to look out here to the camera. I want to clarify something. We had a building grounds meeting last Tuesday night, and I voiced my opinion on the ESG program. Uh, but I want everybody to know I support fixing the courthouse roof because reading the paper Sunday, it kind of maybe come across to some people, some people of the county because I got called about it. I do support fixing the courthouse roof fully, but I do feel like we got ESG. I was just a little upset with the ESG program. I thought that they kind of failed us on doing their job that they were hired to do. But uh, just to let it clarify everything, I do support fixing the courthouse roof. I just want to clarify that. Thank you. Mr. Hilton. Uh, I appreciate everybody tonight. I appreciate a good, healthy debate. And uh, I know we don't always get our way on some things, but what I will say is we had a good discussion tonight, and I feel good about leaving this meeting tonight with that discussion. And with, uh, with that being said, I make a motion we adjourn. We have a motion and we have a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed?